as we continue to love your Bible, we are going chronologically all the way through the Bible, and we have made our way into the New Testament and just made our way now out of the four gospel accounts. There's only one gospel, right? Four gospel accounts given to us by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so we're going to spend this week and next week in the 28 chapters of the book of Acts. You know, it's strange that the second book in a series should be so full of firsts. Luke, sequel, because Luke wrote the gospel, Luke's sequel is Acts. And it tells of Jesus' ascension into heaven and then proceeds to report on a number of firsts. The first sermon by a disciple, the first mistake by a disciple, the first miracle by a disciple, the first day of the church, the first organization of that church, the first orchestrated persecution of Christians, the first Christian martyr, the first non-Jewish convert or Gentile convert, the first missionary journey, and so on and so on and so on. It's just a book of first, particularly in the early chapters. And here's something else that is so interesting about the book of Acts. How quickly the original disciples of Jesus get lost in the picture. The disciples, who of course became apostles, are absolutely revered as being leaders of the church and for being intimately associated with Jesus. In fact, that's one of the qualifications they must have had to become an apostle was to be intimately associated with the ministry of Jesus. But in the book of Acts, as other leaders rise, it eclipses the ministry of the disciples who are very seldom even mentioned in the remainder of the book. John, a handful of times, that's about it. The book is completely dominated in its first half, actually more its first third, by the apostle Peter, and then it is completely dominated by a character we don't even know at the beginning of the book, named Saul of Tarsus, who becomes Paul, in the second half. God's Spirit making extraordinary leaders out of ordinary people is the reason behind the phenomenal success of the first century church. So the book of Acts is going to trace for us the incredible expansion of Christianity in the first century. It explains how the Jewish Messiah became Lord of all in a single generation. Listen to this. In a single generation, the church was able to spread Christianity throughout the entire known world. What's truly astonishing about all the church's success and growth is that it was done without all of the 21st century things that we rely on. They had no technology. They had no YouTube. They had no Facebook with our services on it. They had no microphones. They had no transportation. They had no money. They had no marketing plans. They had no buildings. They had no schools. In fact, what they had was not those things, but persecution, tremendous persecution and hostility. And even families separating from one another and disowning them because they had chosen to become Christians. So how in the world, in that kind of environment, did they literally turn the world upside down, create the most phenomenal success in the history of the church? They did it through the power of the Holy Spirit, We'll talk about that in the sermon this morning. They did it through prayer. They did it through commitment, deep commitment. They did it through fellowship. 
and they did it through faith. And the church today needs to see that was really what their success was all about. When we devote ourselves to the same principles, we too will make a big impact in the world around us. So, the book begins with these simple words. Remember Luke, the physician and the historian, was the author. He had also written the Gospel of Luke. He wrote this some 35 years after the time of Christ. So it's mid-60s to 70s, we think, when he was writing the book of Acts and giving the early history of the church. In my first book, Luke said, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. During those 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive, and he talked to them about the kingdom of God. That's very important. That's very important to what is to come. Because there are some people even today that say, well, Jesus didn't even exist. Or if he did, he was just a good teacher and a man who wasn't resurrected from the dead. So it's very important you understand what's being said here. He lingered with his disciples for 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension into heaven. This is why so few in the first century seriously questioned the legitimacy of the resurrection. There were so many eyewitnesses who saw him. Over 500 at one time, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us. And Luke calls these eyewitness accounts of the risen Christ many convincing proofs. He proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive because the Lord knew the faith of future generations would hinge on the testimony of those eyewitnesses. So he made the evidence clear concise, convincing, with hundreds if not thousands of witnesses. Now in the days between the resurrection and the ascension, Jesus was reviewing his teachings and purpose with his disciples, preparing them for their mission. And part of that teaching contained a promise about their power source after the ascension. On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. And he did in those five chapters, John 13 through 17, to his disciples in the upper room just before he went to the cross. And you'll remember some of those verses that he said things like this. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But watch this verse. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And what will that power be for? To be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now what occurs next must have been an unbelievable and incredible sight to behold. A sight that had to have stayed in the apostles' minds till the day they died. While Jesus was speaking these very things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood behind them in white peril who said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Wow! Can you imagine if you'd have been standing there when that event took place? It had to be burned into their minds for the rest of their life. But ask yourself this question. How do you think the disciples felt at that moment? I mean, 
it was just seven weeks earlier that they had stood at the foot of the cross and watched Jesus be crucified before all but one of them ran. It was just seven weeks before when they knew he was in the tomb and they were hiding in fear. And so they get him back now for seven weeks and then poof, he's gone again. How do you think they felt? I think the popular movie E.T. might capture a little bit of the flavor of the ascension. <laughs> At the end, you remember Elliot, his brother and his sister and their friends have helped E.T. escape from the scientist and E.T.'s ship is waiting and there's a beautiful goodbye and E.T. tells Elliot, I'll be right here and points to Elliot's head. And then E.T. bounces the spaceship and it takes off into space and the family and friends are struck with dumb awe and wonder as they watch it go up into the night sky. And I think that's the way the disciples must have felt as they're standing there and watching Jesus go up until he is enveloped by a cloud. And the only way they could possibly deal with that, now a second time his loss from them, is to realize, in fact, he'll be right here in their mind. I'm sure that moment was a veritable smorgasbord of emotions. The awe was mixed with heartbreak and confusion, and it was all overlaid with terror and grief. They had to feel a certain sense of abandonment again, abandonment akin to what they felt after the crucifixion. There was probably a boatload of separation anxiety as well. But now he was gone again. What are they supposed to do? How are they supposed to carry on his mission that he had set before them? Was this the end again? All those things had to be running through their minds. So the angels said, why are you standing here staring into the sky? They headed back to the upper room to do what Jesus had instructed them to do. But I think they were mostly clueless. They had never experienced what they had just experienced. They had never experienced what they were about to experience. I don't think they had any idea whatsoever what they would experience in 10 days or what was waiting for them on Pentecost. Jesus told them to wait, so they waited. But they didn't have to wait for long because Pentecost was coming. Now, Pentecost is a Greek word meaning 50th. 50th. It was annually celebrated seven weeks and a day after the Sabbath during the Passover. It celebrated the end of the spring harvest and how appropriate for on this day God would bring a new harvest of souls. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Notice this prelude to the miracles that will follow. Good things will happen when a committed group of God's people come together as a workable, wonderful unity and force. Suddenly a wind through blew the house Flames of fire dance over the disciples' heads. Old Testament opening ceremonies for both the tabernacle and the temple, you will recall, we studied one time, brought down fire from heaven and God would consume the sacrifices as an evidence that he was God to his people. So here on Pentecost, God dedicates another temple, a different type. The church would now be God's dwelling place. We would be the temple of God as the disciples would experience the fire from heaven falling down on them, on their heads. What an incredible thing happens next. The great commission that Jesus had given of preaching the gospel to all people could not happen if people had to wait many years to learn the languages of all the peoples in the regions would not be able to happen. 
So gathered there on Pentecost were all sorts of folks, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya, Rome, Cretans. We've been studying about them with Titus on Crete. Arabs, all sorts of people, and they are able to hear by the miracle of speaking in tongues the gospel preached in their own native language. It certainly had to have been a little odd, sort of like hearing Jeff Foxworthy speak fluent French, I would think. I actually was thinking about this. Wouldn't you like to line up people with like a southern accent like his speaking fluent, fluent French or somebody with a British accent having to speak s- southern or maybe line up the three stooges speaking Latin and Greek and Arabic? Wouldn't that be fun? It certainly had to sound a little bit odd, but God had a purpose so that everybody could hear the gospel in their own language. And so people are speaking a foreign language that they've never known, that they've never learned, and the euphoria caused some people to say they must be drunk. No, they weren't drunk, and they weren't speaking in what is often called speaking in tongues today. That's modern glossolalia where you're just saying things, weird things that you don't know and other people can't interpret it. No, these are people speaking clearly in languages that other people can understand and can hear the gospel in. And then, remember Peter? Remember our last contact with Peter? (laughs) Our last contact with Peter in the gospels was he was the man who played chicken while warming at the devil's fire before the rooster crowed. And he now is given the task of preaching the first gospel sermon. And this same guy who was a chicken just eight weeks before now boldly stands up before the people in Jerusalem and says, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people aren't drunk. It's only nine in the morning. No, you're seeing the prophecy that Joel laid out for you. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted at the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. When you receive the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, you can move quickly from chicken to courageous. And that's what Peter did. And his words so pierced their heart that they said to him and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? And Peter said, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Did you hear about the teacher at school who told her class that tomorrow for show and tell, I want all of you to bring something that shows your particular religious beliefs. One little girl was a Catholic, so she brought a rosary and explained about the rosary and the prayers that went along with the various beads. And then there was the little boy who brought a statue of Buddha and explained that he was a Buddhist and what the statue of Buddha meant for his family. And on and on it went. And the last little girl was a member of the Church of Christ. And she brought a casserole. But she said the only reason she brought a casserole is she could not physically bring a baptistry. So she thought that would be the next best thing. (laughs) Acts 2.38 has sort of been our verse. We've grown up with a heavy emphasis on baptism. And I think that's good because the New Testament has a heavy emphasis on baptism. But this passage is just one of so many we could go through that says basically the same thing. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. So in Christ Jesus, you're all children of God through faith for you who were baptized into Christ 
have clothed yourselves with Christ. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Calling on the name of the Lord was what Ananias told Saul, and this is Saul's own conversion experience account that he's telling himself. And that's what he said. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. In 1 Peter 3, 21, in Noah's ark, only a few people ate and all were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. It's not the water. It's not the removal of dirt. It's the obedience and the pledge of a good conscience toward God. Every time that God, and I forgot that one, every time that God saw fit to connect baptism in Scripture with salvation in Scripture. The order was always baptism, then salvation. Don't take my word for it. Look it up. Study it yourself. Every time. And the result of Peter's preaching was absolutely astonishing. I want to break this first down in two parts. Here's the first astonishing part of it. Everybody who accepted his message that day were baptized. Do you think they had any doubt about what he had told them to do? Every one of them. And that day about 3,000 people added to them. And then notice immediately what they started to do. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So from its very beginning, the early church built on a solid foundation, devoting themselves to a few simple principles. Teaching. Why? Because we learn the Lord's Word and the Lord's will through preaching and teaching and personal Bible study. Bible school classes, small group studies, our own personal reading and study of the Scriptures. It's the reason we're doing Love Your Bible. All emphasize the same thing the very first church emphasized, teaching of the Word of God. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. Fellowship isn't just getting together and sharing a meal. I'm glad we do that on Wednesday nights, but that's not all it is. Fellowship is a way of life. It is a way of treating one another. It means that we act in a certain way toward one another, and it likewise means we don't act in other certain ways toward one another. The best way to explain true fellowship is to simply go to your concordance and look up the word fellowship and the more than 50 times that it is mentioned in the New Testament and see it, it's in its context, what fellowship truly means. For instance, we're told to love one another, encourage one another, be devoted to one another, live in harmony with one another, accept one another, serve one another, forgive one another, confess your sins one to another. More than 50 times fellowship is mentioned in those ways. And then the breaking of bread. And that refers to communion or the Lord's Supper. Some translations actually say Lord's Supper. So as we participate weekly in communion, it signifies that we hold something precious and dear in common, a union in the body of Christ. It's another thing I might add that separates us from most religious groups. We don't have to guess this. We know this from history, that the early church practiced communion on the first day of the week, on Sunday. We know that also from comparing the Greek words in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 with the Greek words in Acts 20, verse 7. Acts 20, verse 7 says, you know, that they, uh, the, they uh, devoted themselves on the first day of the week. They'd come together on the first day of the week to break bread. Exact same words are used in 1 Corinthians 16 to describe they came together on the first day of the week to take a collection. Same words. Some churches take a collection every first day of the week, don't practice communion every first day of the week, which is most important to them. Man, I'm telling you one thing, I'd rather us break bread every first day than take a collection every first day. That's more biblical. And that's just the truth of the matter. And then to prayer. Prayer is our way of communicating with God. Since God speaks to us through His Word, and we speak to God through prayer, if we don't devote ourselves to prayer, we have literally cut off half the communication line between us and God. So you look at these things on the first day of the church. No gimmicks, 
no gadgets, no programs, no pageants, just the Lord adding to his church as they honor him with obedience and a devotion to truth and following a few basic spiritual principles. It is the same model for churches to follow today. But immediately, they get into big trouble. Because there are Jews who don't like this new religion called the way. They're not yet being called Christians or Christianity. They don't like the way. And there are Romans who don't like it either. Well, guess who the two most powerful groups of people are in the region? The Jews and the Romans. And so Acts chapter 4 records the beginning of the first period of persecution for the infant church and particularly for the apostles. But even in the face of opposition and hostility, God continues to bless the church with growth. So in just a short period of time, the number of men who believed grew to 5,000 from that 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. You know if there are 5,000 men around, what else is going to be around? 5,000 women are around that number and more children probably. And when Peter and John here in Acts chapter 4 were paraded in front of the religious Jewish leaders to account for their teachings about Jesus, they didn't back down one little bit. They boldly proclaimed, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then you know this and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we may be saved. Notice it wasn't at this point the pagan crowd or the Romans harassing the apostles. It was the religious crowd. The Jews, so afraid of losing their following among the people, so afraid of losing their popularity. Reminds me of what the great Vance Havner once said, the temple of truth has never suffered so much from woodpeckers on the outside as from termites within. And that's true. The religious leaders were the termites within. And they were now in a bind, as the text clearly indicates, because here this lame man has just been healed. What are you going to say about that? That's some pretty strong evidence. So they've arrested Peter and John, but when they saw the courage of Peter and John that we just read and realized they were unschooled and ordinary men, they were astonished. And I love, love this next line. They took note that these men had been with Jesus. My question to you to ask yourself in spiritual inventory periodically is, can people see that you have been with Jesus? That's a great question to ask yourself as a part of a spiritual inventory. Is there something in you that people can see that you have been with Jesus? I love this too. Peter and John said, do you think God wants to obey you rather us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. I love it. Rest us, beat us, put us in jail, do whatever you want to us, but we cannot help but tell about what we have seen and heard. We're seeing a man raised from the dead. We're seeing a lame man from birth healed. You think we're going to stop talking about that? In the next few verses, the priest further questioned them and threatened them, but ultimately reluctantly released them. And you would think, if it had been you or me in that setting, and I have been in this setting one time in a Virginia police station for preaching the gospel, you'd think that Peter and John would be happy to dodge a bullet and lay low for a while. Not, they returned to the other disciples and immediately offered up 
a model prayer for persecuted believers. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Do you see that? Rather than praying for personal protection, they didn't say a word about personal protection. They prayed for greater impact and for stronger boldness. Phillips Brooks once said, do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger men and women. Do not pray for tasks equal to your powers. Pray for powers equal to your tasks. So true. In Acts chapter 5, we find the grim tale of Ananias and Sapphira. In fact, one might say Acts chapter 5 is a drop-dead passage. One might say Acts chapter 5 is a killer of a Bible study. I could go on if you want me to. Had enough? All right. Sort of reminds me of two preachers discussing their churches with one talking about his congregation's explosive growth, and he asked his preacher friend, how about y'all? And he said, well, we haven't had any new additions, but we've had some blessed subtractions. Well, what happened here in Acts chapter 5 was a blessed subtraction, you might say, because Ananias and Sapphira sold a piece of land, pretended they gave all the money to the church because earlier in the chapter before, that's what Barnabas, the great son of encouragement, had done. And the church was so thrilled, and it helped everybody, and everybody's spirit was great, and they wanted that spirit too, and they wanted that image as well. So they sold a portion of the property and gave a part of it, but said they gave it all. Now understand, God never commanded anybody to sell their land and pool their resources. Some had. Some had, but it wasn't required, wasn't even requested. But to this carnal couple, image was everything, and they wanted to look more spiritual than they really were, attempting to lie to the Holy Spirit. So Peter calls the couple on the carpet for their carnality. And, you know, it says something to us about this was never repeated. This is early in the infant church, I think, to make a point. It's never been repeated, as far as I know, not only in the early church history, but in modern history. But it says something about inflating our claims or the gospel being more about us and our popularity than about him or talking a degree of devotion we've never demonstrated or never even thought about demonstrating. To this carnal couple, image was everything. They wanted to look more spiritual than they actually were were. And so it's obvious that God used a higher standard in the infant church, probably, to protect its purity. But I do sometimes, as I did when I was writing this particular section of your manuscript, sit back for just a minute at my desk and think, what if God judged me to the same degree that he judged Ananias and Sapphira? What if God judged all of us to the same degree that he judged Ananias and Sapphira, and not just by our actions, by our thoughts? I think we'd have to build a morgue somewhere back there in the back of the building, and it's probably what we'd have to do. The apostles wouldn't stop preaching, so the Sadducees wouldn't stop persecuting. And filled with jealousy, once again, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. And once again, the apostles answered with a classic, a classic soundbite, you might say today. The council said, we gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name. Behold, you filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood on us, the Jewish leaders. Peter and the apostles answered in this classic response, we must obey God rather than men. 
We must obey God rather than men. Now, that ticked them off even further. When the council members heard this, they were enraged, and they resolved to put the apostles to death. And at that point, a gal, a Pharisee named Gamaliel stepped into the scene injecting a little common sense. Now, I'm going to read all this, just going to tell you what it says, all right? Gamaliel, well-respected, stepped in and said, listen, if these men are truly the work of God, nothing you do are going to stop them. And if these men are not truly the work of God, nothing you do to help them is going to help them. That's basically what he said. And so they decided, well, that makes sense. A little common sense sometimes makes good sense. And so they said, release them and let them go. Now, 2,000 years later, Jesus is still growing strong because God was in it, and if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. The church has had 2,000 years of persecution now. The church has persecution this very moment as we sit here around the world. And if it is truly of God, you're not able to overthrow it. Nobody will ever be able to overthrow the kingdom of God because it is an eternal kingdom. Amazingly, persecution brought more power to the apostles. Each attempt to silence them only strengthened their resolve and increased their boldness. Winston Churchill once said, a fanatic is someone who can't change his mind and won't change the subject. <laughs> I like that. Well, that was an accurate description of the first <laughs> Christians. They wouldn't change their mind, and they wouldn't change the subject. And they just kept preaching about Jesus. And so the number of the disciples just kept on increasing. And so the more you grow, the more you have problems the more situations you have to handle. And the early church was experiencing such explosive growth that its leaders and resources were unable to keep up. Now, up to this point, the ministry of the church revolved around the 12 apostles. 12 men were being asked pretty well to do it all for a rapidly growing church numbering on the thousands. And the problem was not the presence of prejudice or favoritism, just the absence of delegation and time and organization. It was becoming impossible for 12 men to oversee every ministry of the church. So the apostles made an important decision about priorities. And they said, pick out among yourselves seven men that you trust, men who are full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom. And we are going to have them wait tables and take care of these physical duties and details that need done. Some people have called these the first seven deacons. I think they probably were. But the solution provided a dual blessing. The word and prayer were not neglected because the apostles said, y'all do that, we'll do this. We will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And so the word and prayer were not neglected, but the people were involved in the blessing of serving and being in the work of God. And one of those guys really stood out. He, look, he's one of the seven that was named, verse 5 and 6 say, and he just took off. He just took off. Because, you know, God, when he's gifted somebody and that person is fully sold out to him, God can take that person and just elevate them as a leader. And that's what happened with Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power. And suddenly he was able to perform miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit. And opposition arose immediately to him. By the end of chapter 6, he was such a dynamic leader that he is accused of blasphemy against the Jewish temple and the law of Moses. And he's hauled into court and confronted by a high priest. And the priest says, are these charges true? And Stephen's answer is an absolute masterpiece. He traces Jewish history demonstrating how God was always up to something new, yet each initiative was always met with resistance by his people, just like we've studied all through the Old Testament. I mean, Stephen gave a way, way better Old Testament survey than I've done in Love Your Bible. 
right here in this passage. And needless to say, his plain speaking did not go over very well. Verse 54 describes a group of pit bulls in religious robes ready to tear his throat out. And at that moment, Stephen sees a vision of Jesus. And he says, I see a vision of Jesus. And that so infuriates them that they began to stone Stephen to death. And in a bath of blood, he emulates Jesus Christ, his Savior on the cross, by saying, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Just as Jesus has said, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they do. Stephen says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And Lord, don't lay this sin to their charge. Wow. Now, it's been said the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church by Tertullian, and that's true. That's very true. We're tempted to think of persecution as something bad, but in this instance, it was something good for the church. Because remember, Jesus had told them from the very beginning, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He had given them the Great Commission. He had emphasized it. He had also said it again just before we study today his ascension into heaven. He had told them to go everywhere. They had not done it. They had stayed close to home. They had stayed with what was comfortable. They'd stayed in and around Jerusalem, witnessing only to Jews. And the persecution forced them to do what they should have done in the first place. Because of the persecution against the church in Jerusalem, they were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria, and those who had been scattered preached the word everywhere they went. The implication for us is, look for the possibilities in our problems. Philip, who was engaged in a tremendously successful evangelistic work in Samaria, interrupts his ministry to obey what seems to be an improbable and impractical command. He is told to go out basically in the wilderness where an Ethiopian dignitary is sitting in his chariot reading from Isaiah chapter 53. And this exchange takes place. Philip ran up to him and heard reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, well, how can I unless someone guides me? And so Philip went up and sat and he was reading from Isaiah 53 verses 3 through 5. And, and the eunuch said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself, Isaiah, or of some other man? And Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture preached Jesus to him. And as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see his water, what hinders me from being baptized? Now, why did the eunuch ask that question? Very clearly, as he's preaching Jesus and the gospel to him, he's telling him about Pentecost. He's telling them about repent and be baptized, every one of you. Philip did not bring up the question. The eunuch did. They're out in the desert, and the eunuch says, see here is water, what hinders me from being baptized? And he said, well, if you believe, you can. And he said, I believe. And right out there in the desert, he baptized him. So, doesn't it seem obvious that an essential part of teaching the eunuch the good news about Jesus was baptism for the forgiveness of sins as it had been in every other instance in the New Testament church? I mean, the New Testament is consistent and unwavering in this teaching. So, as we get to the end of Acts chapter 8, the most prominent character in the early chapters of Acts is Peter speaking for the apostles as a leader of the church. But Acts chapter 9 begins a dividing point, recording how a fierce enemy of the early church becomes a passionate preacher for the early church. 
Saul, the persecutor of Christians, becomes Paul, the preacher and persuader of Christians. And really the focus through the remainder of the book, beginning in verse 9, is on the ministry of the apostle to the Gentiles, Saul. So next week we pick up in Acts chapter 9 and we'll go to the end of the book. But I want you to notice, he's there in chapter 8. He's there giving approval to Stephen's death. He's trying to kill Christians. And when, next week, we're going to see he's going to try to make Christians. That's a big transfer and change, isn't it?